You're listening to the Academy Podcast, presenting an innovative curriculum for personal growth. Sit in on exclusive conversations with influential people as they share the secrets that made them the front runners in their industries. Now, here are your hosts, Austin and Kagia. Welcome once again to the Academy. Today we have with us, I'm very proud to announce, uh, Dr. Rico Short, a fellow classmate from Morris Brown College. Yes, uh, sir. Who has gone on to do wonderful things there in the Atlanta area. Um, we're glad to be able to speak with him on today. Um, again, your hosts are Pastor Kagia Scott and Pastor Austin Humphreys. And we are just delighted to sit back and listen to some inspirational words uh, from the author of two books and uh, the owner of the private dental practice there in Atlanta. And so we can start just by, by asking, um, Doc, how did you decide even uh, to go into dentistry in the first place? Like, what was that for you? What was well, that? That's a, that's a great question. I kind of um, backed into it because as a kid, I used to love candy, man. And, you know, Halloween was more important than Christmas. So I eat a lot of candy. Unfortunately, my mom didn't have the finances to take me to the dentist every six months. So I used to have these crazy, you know, toothaches, man. And um, I remember as a kid, like I was like six years old, I had to get all four of my front teeth pulled because they were rotten. Mm -hmm. And so um, I just remembered that. And so as I was going through um, high school, I always liked math and science and I wanted to be some kind of doctor and um and i kind of looked in different programs and i was fortunate enough to have a have a um mentor um, my high school connected me with a mentor who happened to be a dentist who happened to be black and that was my first time I've ever seeing a black doctor um period in my area i grew up in columbus georgia and what? so um he he basically took me under his wing and um he he exposed me to other areas of medicine and even other things like, you know, um, being an attorney and all the other thing. And I just wanted to, you know, graft it towards dentistry. And, um, and I wanted to help people because I knew what it was like to have a toothache. And I knew how important, you know, um, a, a dentist was. And, and I, I see my mom have toothaches. I see her cry herself to sleep with toothaches. And I'm like, man, if I can do something to really help somebody alleviate that. And, and you guys out there, if you never had a toothache, man, it is like, the worst like no it's terrible ever. it's terrible you know, it's something that you can't even you can't sleep you can't eat you yeah. can't even think because it's so close to your brain man it's just it just messes you up and um you know the ability to be able to go in there and really turn someone's life around in a matter of like you know an hour is is, is an awesome um skill to have and so i met my mentor and um ironically um i found out he was a morris brown graduate and then I was like, all right, let me follow in his footsteps. So that's how I got to Morris Brown. He went to dental school at Georgia. I went to dental school there and I actually worked with him for a few years and he kind of kicked me out of the nest. He's like, man, you got more potential. You can become a specialist. And I went on to become an endodontist, which is a root canal specialist. And um, I've been in my own practice now for 16 years. Wow. So, you know, you, you being, you just said 16 years, you, you being an African-American male, uh, having your own practice um, uh, for 16 years, first of all, that's, that's a major feat as it is, um, especially in society like this, where we don't see a lot um, of, of men of color uh, or, or people in color in general in, the, in that particular field. Talk to us about starting your own business, um, having, having that practice. What have some of the challenges been and what have you overcome in these last 16 years? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. Um, you know, first of all, to be, you know, to be, to be honest, when I finished uh, my residency, um, I just didn't have any business skills and wow. I was scared to start my own practice. So I worked for like three different other offices and trying to figure it out. And my last office I, I worked at, um, it was a multicultural group. There was a Greek, guy and there was a um, Jewish guy and there was an Indian guy and I, I wanted to make sure I learned as much business because I knew the dentistry I went to school for that and and they gave me a lot of um, business uh, tips but they wanted me to buy in and the, the price they asked me to buy in I'm like man I can buy my own practice for 
this. <laughs> this is kind of absurd. Yeah. So I just took a leap of faith. I was like, man, you know, I don't know exactly how to do it, but I'm going to try. And the worst thing that could happen, if it doesn't work out, you know, I can always go back and work for somebody else. And I took a leap of faith, man. And, um, you know, fortunately at the time, this was in 2003, um, I was able to get a loan, man. I didn't have any money, no collateral. I didn't have a rich uncle to come out the poorhouse to help me out. Yeah. And I applied for a loan for like three hundred and fifty thousand dollars. And I'm like, man, these people are gonna laugh at me in my face. I, I don't. I, I'm a, I already have almost three hundred thousand dollars in student loan debt. And believe it or not, man, they gave it to me. You know, they wow. they gave it to me. And so that's how I. Um, started the practice from scratch. Um, I, I started in Smyrna, where I still am today. And when I first opened up, there was no other African American, period, um, you know, uh, dentist in that area. And the guy that owned my building, he happened to be an older Caucasian guy. And um, so, you know, it was tough. The first month, um, I, I, I got um, racial slurs. Um, spray painted all on my um the front of my office and got it egged and all that kind of stuff and they were oh, pretty wow. much telling me to get out and um and i told him you know i was like you know i told the, the the landlord i'm like hey what is going on over here? i don't feel safe and he was like oh well you know some people just don't like change you know you'll be fine and i was getting ready to hightail it out of smyrna you know and smyrna is a cop county which if you know much about Atlanta Cobb County, that, that used to be a pretty rough area for minorities. Um, you know, just a lot of things that happened. So, so anyway, I decided to stick it out and, um, you know, and just trusted God and he just sustained us there. And, you know, through all the highs and lows, because you still have people come in, you know, they, they kind of get thrown off because my first name is Rico. So it's like, oh, this guy's probably Spanish. <laughs> Last name short, they can't figure it out. And then they see me and it was like, wait a minute, am I in the right, right place? Right. You know, and so uh, I have to, you know, so no matter how many qualifications I have, uh, certificates and stuff, we always have to, I still have to prove myself to them. And some of them, frankly, some of the referring dentists, they are either intimidated because I am African American male or, um, you know, if they, say something I don't agree with, I stand up to what it is and they don't refer because I'm telling them the truth. But sometimes it's hard for them to accept the truth from somebody that isn't supposed to know more than they know. Right. And those can be tough. And so, you know, we have that to deal with still. And also to, um, you know, some of the um, African-American patients come in and you know, they think they need to get the hook up because they, oh man, you know, hey man, you know, mm. but I know when they go to the other places, the majority of places, they don't act right. like that or they don't ask for that. So, right. um, so we kind of, you kind of feel it on both sides, you know, wow. and so it's just, it's just, you know, been a, a very interesting journey, uh, full of ups and downs, but um, won't trade it for anything in the world, you know, because it really, has taught me a lot about life and how life works and and basically your faith man you just have to trust God what god has told you and and Amen. he's gonna he's gonna be faithful to his word so, so you 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 say you wouldn't do it another way but this this is kind of what i'm thinking when you decided to go to smyrna instead of staying somewhere in atlanta um to me i, I just kept thinking about jackie robinson you know, going to the Dodgers instead of just staying in the Negro League where everybody loved him. He didn't have no drama. He's a superstar. He'd have been great in the Negro League. But he went through all of that. And it's like, man, would I have gone through that? You know, would it be worth it? And I hear you saying it was worth it. Tell me about your decision to even start in a place where you wasn't so welcome as you would have been in the heart of Atlanta. Yeah, well, the thing is, um, I didn't do much research as far as the demographics and stuff. I actually had a consultant that did that, and he told me Smyrna would be a great place because they don't even have a root canal specialist there. Right. Right. So, so based on that, he said there's a, there's a need because people have to travel way outside of Smyrna to even see a specialist. Well, in Atlanta, there's a lot more competition there. So he was just like, you know what, Atlanta 
you know, even though you probably, well, he didn't even go into detail. I mean, you know, not, in retrospect, I think the guy really wanted to sell anyway. You know I mean? I get it. You know, but at the same time, it's like, hey, if you put your roots here and you do well here, I mean, you have a whole bunch of dentists. You have like maybe 20 or 30 dentists within a mile radius. But what he didn't tell me is nobody was African-American. Most of them were old school white guys. Right. And it would take, you know, an act of God for a lot of them to refer to you. Um, in fact, there was one particular situation. My wife's a hygienist. And I remember starting my practice and, um, you know, things were going well. About We had about a year or two under my belt. Um, and I wanted to get my dream car. And I remember, and my wife worked for this um, this Caucasian male dentist. And um, so something happened to her car, so she had to drive my car. Well, I had bought, in 2005, I had bought a 6 Series BMW convertible black, mm -hmm. all the nine. And I'm, you know, and I'm like... You know, this this car payment is almost more than my mortgage you know it was just something i was like, i gotta just do for myself yeah so my wife drove it up there and he ran outside it's like whose car is this my said, oh this is this is my husband's car and his my car was messed up it's like oh my god like how did he get the money to pay for this and this guy would send me all his patients to do root canals on him when he saw that car he stopped sending me any patients wow and he's right up the road. And I'm like, so because you saw my wife driving this car, you're gonna just stop sending me patients. And my wife told me, she said that, you know, he had a mentality of black supposed to only be at certain level and they can't, they don't go no further. And if they going further than that, as he's assisting that, that's a problem. Wow. So wow. We, didn't have, we didn't get any more patients from him. And it had nothing to do with my skill because we had seen plenty of patients from him. My right. wife worked for him for a year. And all of a sudden, when he saw that car, he just cut us off. And so, I'm just like, man, how, you know, it's crazy. So still where you are today, and I just, let's just flesh this out as we talk about this. You are still, in a sense, not only dealing with the competition, but you are dealing with the 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 racial side of this too, even as, as you said, you have the skill, but based on just the color of your skin that you are being looked at differently, how did you, I mean, maneuver, how do you continue to maneuver through that? How is God blessing you despite that? As I think our listeners and those who are watching, yeah. we can see how God is, is allowing you to still be blessed. Well, 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 the thing is once, once God put a promise in you, you know, yeah. can't, can't nobody, change it it's like it's like you know um you know at one point you know i was very shy very afraid to show off my blessings or what god has blessed me with because you're gonna have that and i'm like it can really hurt my business and to be honest with you even amongst african americans they can be jealous so i would get hurt from both sides and i was just like you know what god you did not give me these things to hide them you gave me these things to encourage and so everything that i have is a ministry tool like my six series which i still have on the back of it it says prvb 47 well i get stopped all the time say what is that it's proverbs 47 um wisdom is the principal thing and all i get in get understanding that's what it is it's a ministry tool so what happens is when i pull up in that car going talking to some high school kids they're gonna look out i'm like whose car is that and that's going to prompt them to have the conversation. Of, oh, I can be a doctor. I don't have to be a drug dealer, be able to play basketball. I can have some nice things because that's kind of what grabbed me as a 13, 14 year old when my mentor, who was a dentist, came to pick me up. Well, he didn't pick me up in a beat up Chevy. He picked me up in the brand new SC400 Lexus. I'm like, dude, how did you get this? Right. And he's like, oh. You can get it. You just have to work hard, stay in school. You can come a doctor. You can get everything you want. And for me, that worked. I was able to put my hand on it. And then he took me to where he lived, was a country club. Now, mind you, this guy had been in practice for 25 years. It didn't happen overnight. But the fact that it could happen, that engaged me. And so I was like, all right, I know our culture. And I know that they have to have something to see, touch, or feel. So I was able to ask God to let me leverage everything I have to actually show you glory. So 
So not only that, I have the car. Um, I'm also known as a root canal specialist to the stars. I work on a lot of celebrities here. A lot of them take pictures with me and I'm friends with them. And, you know, um, and, you know, uh, you know, God has blessed me with nice things. I mean, you know, I, I said I wasn't going to, I'm done with cars and, you know, God blessed me to, to get another car. I mean, I, I drive a Maserati as well. And on the back of my license plates, it says Grace Life. And yeah. it talks, and, and me, when I do my podcast and I talk, well, not podcast, when I do my social media posts, I always talk about the grace of God and how, you know, um, the blessing should not be hidden if you are doing it with the right motive, you know, right. because, and that's what I always try to do. I always try to put God into the forefront of everything that he gives me. And it's not about me and what I've done. It's about, hey, this is what he's able to do through me. So. That, that brings me that brings me to another question because just the whole um, looking from 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 outside your situation, just watching you on social media and seeing you, um, you've always had a, a spirituality about you. You've always been witnessing um, about God um, more so than, than than whatever else you are you're doing, and so I'm wondering. Um, how the the Christianity interfaces with your practice is there is there a line between um, mm -hmm. your religion and mm -hmm. your profession or 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 what well I mean it's kind of like you know for me I try to pattern myself like how Jesus did you know Jesus they say Jesus was a friend of sinners you know they called him that so so he was able to morph into whatever his environment was and able to encourage people with not about religion, it's about relationship and give them real life principles and practice. So in my practice, I don't have, and at one point, it's funny you asked that, um, Kagia, because I was like, man, I'm just going to be paying Christian music. I'm going to put crosses, all that. And I'm like, man, <laughs> Jesus wouldn't do that. Right. Jesus would make people come in. And they don't even know what they got half of the time until they left. Or it might be a year later, like, dang, he, he said that. And so for me, my message is more subliminal. Now, if someone said, hey, no, Dr. Short, can you pray over me before we do the root canal because I'm scared as I don't know what? Yeah, I'll do that. But you won't see anything, you know, boasting about Christ because I believe if you have to do that, and then, you know, I, I just believe that, you know, it, it may turn some people off. In fact, I know it does because um, every now and again, I'll get a disgruntled patient and they'll go, on, I was looking at my reviews, which I never should do that. But every now and again, I was like, let me see what these people are saying. So <laughs> I had this guy, uh, this, this Muslim guy came in. Uh, we took care of him and he's like, you know, Dr. Shore, he did a great job, but he's a racist. I'm like, what? And he probably saw my book, probably talking about Jesus, probably seeing... Because my book, my books are actually on the coffee table, along with other magazines and books. But my book is there, so he probably picked it up. He might not agree with something I said, and you know, and say, "Oh yeah, he's a, he's a racist or whatever." You know, so so I mean, so for me, I, I'm I'm more or less try to give them the message of Christ just in a very subliminal way, um, unless we have time to engage in the conversation. So. Um, and that's just the way I've done it. So, so, so that of course leads me to another question before my next question. So, um, being that you are a Christian, you know, it's hard to, to hide your Christianity, you know, it's all draped over you. So being that you are a Christian though, in business, um, how has it, affected the way you go about business what are some things maybe that if you weren't a christian you would have done like everybody else but since you are a christian you had to go another route and god <laughs> saw you through that like oh yeah well we, we we experienced those i experienced that the other day we had a lady that came in um she said she was in a lot of pain but i'm looking and i'm like i don't see anything and so she got to the front, we did an exam, and she's like, I just, you know, and it was an African-American lady, she said, I just need my money back. I'm like, 
why? She's like, well, you didn't do anything. I'm like, ma'am, you came in, you know, we looked at you. We didn't see any reason to do a root canal or anything. And, um, you know, well, you got what you paid for. And she's like, no, 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 you just, I know you, you just did not treat me fairly, da, da, da. And I'm thinking like, what? And she would not leave. She wouldn't leave. And I was like, mm -hmm. ma'am, you're going to have to leave um, because I have other patients to take care of and, and this and that. She was like, I just need some pain medicine. I said, ma'am, I just can't give you pain medicine if I don't mm -hmm. see the source of where it is. My license can be taken, right. things like that. And um, so she just would not leave. She just kept talking. I just, you know, I, and she was like, I just can't, I just don't like the service here. And I just said, you know what? I understand. I, I understand. I kept saying that. And my mind, I'm praying, my like, God, please get her out here before I call the police. And if I wasn't a Christian, I would have cursed her out and, and scared her out of there. I'm like, you know what? You in my house. This right. is my practice. I can pull out. I'll pull out my 45 on you. You know what I mean? Right, right, and get right. you out of here or call the police. And finally, she left. And then I, I looked. I actually looked the patient up. But come to find out, she was a drug seeker. She had already got like 63 narcotics um, mm -hmm. in a matter of a week from other um providers and that's what she wanted right. so you know so in those instances that's just one instance um other instances where people come in and it's like hey doc i'm gonna pay you cash man and you know if you if i pay you cash you don't got to report it on your um taxes and you can keep the money i say nah man i say every dime and i honor god from day one i say every dime i get i'm reporting it i don't care if it's cash or not and it was like, you really do that? Most people don't do that if it's cash. I say, well, no, I said, I want to honor God and honor this practice in his name. So even if someone paid me cash, credit card, whatever, it all goes to be reported to the IRS. It all gets deposited. And if I wasn't a believer, I mean, there's people that come in and they need three root canals. They may have to drop three grand cash. And say, like, hey, you know, this is $3,000. So instead of, instead of you charging me 3000 can you charge me 2500 and you just put it all in your pocket. I was like, no, I can't do that. You know, it's that's real though. So, um, yeah. so it's yeah. something that wow. you know it allows you know me to be able to sleep at night. And ironically, about my third year in the practice, we were um, audited by the federal government. Randomly, they came in, they checked all our records, and all our records were you know normally they would spend like three days. This lady spent a day, and she was like everything is clean like you ain't hide nothing she was just like who does your records i said well my wife and she's like well does she want a job because we can use somebody <laughs> and she's like we don't we don't run into this and so for me you know i just believe in doing everything i can you know the right way it allows me to sleep at night it honors god and i think that's why he continues to and, bless and us dr short it just sounds like you know, hard work pays off, but there's also favor on your life, too. I, I think I hear that, I you, and, you know, I, I like what you said earlier. You said, look, you, you work for this. You, this is your, you have skill. But I just think I, I sense the favor of the Lord that's kind of just been on you. And I, I think it's encouraging for those who are younger, who have kind of maybe in your spot, who are coming out of med school, who want to start the business, who are not sure. What's your advice to, the, to a person at, at the stage that you were in 16 years, years ago? What would you give them? The advice that you would give them if they want to start something new, do something outside of their comfort zone that has kind of helped you to where you are today. Yeah, I mean, I would I would tell the the, the younger person, the young, you know, whoever it is, um, you know, first of all, um, you know, master your craft, know what you're doing, because even if you open a practice and you're not, uh, if you're still green, so to speak, like my grandmother says, is going to hurt you, you know, so you want to make sure that you know what you're doing. And second of all, you want to, you know, take some business classes. And third of all, make sure you get a mentor, um, mm. get somebody that, that have um, walked your walk and they can kind of help you through the highs and lows when you're starting from, from scratch, because a lot of people uh, go out there and they're on a wing and a prayer. And that's not the smartest way. I think God can help you through that. But if you have a mentor um, that somebody that has done it and willing to, you know, take you under their wing and help you, um, you know, that would be, um, you know, important. And the other thing is, I would say, hey, if you do start your own business, make sure you um, have good credit. Uh, make sure your credit is good, because if business is slow, you're going to need a line of credit of some sort. 
And also you want to live below your means, you know, mm-hmm. and a lot of times what I find these young dentists, and young doctors, they're like, man, I worked so hard and they want the instant gratification. And you, I mean, you're staring $300,000, student loan debt, but then you want to try to get a, you know, a million dollar home. It's like, man, you hustling backwards. You will get to there, wow. you know, but you want to make sure that you lay a solid foundation early, make sure that you start your business um, on the right footing, make sure you start, as um, soon as you start your business, implement some kind of 401k profit sharing, retirement stuff early and set it up properly. And, um, and you know, stay away from what you see on social media because a lot of times, man, this is lies, you know, and, and everybody want to flex and have mm. this and have that. Mm. And um, a lot of times that'll pressure you into buying stuff you may not need at the time. Um, and and I, I, I tell young guys, I say, you know what, keep it clean and mean, man. You don't have to buy a lot of this stuff out there and to have a good product, you know, keep it clean and mean, man. You don't, you don't have to, to be in the nicest building and have the nicest everything for people to come and see you. You know, you want it to be, um, you know, neat and clean, but you don't have to break the bank to do it, you know? Right. So those are some things that I would, I would, you know, I love that. Urge them. I love that. So, so we, we definitely got to transition um, into to what you're doing for the benefit of humanity. Um, outside of your profession. Uh, we understand that, that you're an author of two books um, and, and, we, and you, you may reference, you know, you just threw it in there, but you made <laughs> reference to the fact that when you go talk to kids and we've already heard that that was kind of how you got turned on in the first place. And so we see you paying it backwards or paying it forward. Yeah. Um, and, 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 and we just want to hear you kind of talk about um, your inspirational books and as well as, as the work that you're doing um, in the community when you go into Absolutely, and absolutely. Help people. Yeah. Well, a couple of things, you know, we, we do a lot of stuff in the community. Um, first of all, there are um, two um, nonprofit dental clinics that I volunteer at. One is called the Ben Macell Dental Clinic downtown. If you don't have enough money, uh, we would see you and we would do all kinds of dentistry, um, you know, for free or a $2 donation. And I've been doing that for the past 15 years. Um, so we do get, we do, and I, I, I go there once a month and then once a month I teach there and I don't get paid. So I teach other dentists how to do a root canal uh, pain-free and teach dental students as well. Wow. Um, so, so we, we do give back there. Um, and also, um, I created a scholarship in my name, um, at the dental school at the medical college of Georgia. It's called the Dr. Rico short scholarship. And that's given to a second year, uh, minority who's struggling financially. And so that's mm-hmm. something that I've been doing. I think this is my fourth or fifth year doing that because when I graduated, I was the only African-American male in my class and I needed a lot of financial help. And there was no, none of the other successful, well, I won't say none of them. There was very few successful African, African African-Americans to give back to the school and make it so that another African-American or minority can benefit because it's not an African-American there. If it's like another minority, you know, um, that's fine. So, um, so I've established that. Um, and also too, I go out to different schools, um, high schools, middle schools, elementary schools, all of Atlanta, um, and talk to kids about how to be successful. Talk to kids about what it's like being a doctor. Talk to kids about my background, how I grew up from a single parent household, never knew my father growing up in a tough environment um, and deciding I wanna make something out of myself um and in the process of that um every place where i went they were like hey we you don't have any material i'm like no and then what i decided to do was like i need to write a book so that's when i wrote my first book it's called get into the root of your problem 365 days of inspirational thinking and basically it's like a daily inspirational kind of like a purpose-driven life book and i wrote it because i know a lot of people 
in my community, unfortunately, they don't like to read the Bible. It's too much. It's too confusing. So I said, I'm going to give them some bite-side nuggets of truth. Some of it is comedy. Some of it is, is, is philosophical. Data is all about getting to the root of whatever problem they have, give them tools to be successful, and just encourage them in life. Um, so, and so when I get done speaking, you know, I give an opportunity um, I usually give one book away and then I give them opportunity to purchase another book. Um, mm -hmm. You know, like I just opened it right here to day 260. It says today work on turning negative energy into positive energy. Mm -hmm. You can do it. It starts with your words and that's it. That's all you have to meditate on the day. You putting it down. That's it. So mm -hmm. even with that, and you just meditate on just that your words and positive energy, Man, that can turn into something amazing. That can turn someone's life around. That can turn someone's situation around. Just based on that's a sneaky devotional. That's it right. Is. It is. Yeah. It's say it is a sneaky devotional. Absolutely. <laughs> that's a devotional. Three hundred sixty yeah. days, man. Yeah. Good. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, um, yeah. So um, and you know, and it's just it's just it's just a pretty cool you know tool, and and it actually goes with. Um, you know, on the bottom, in the Donuts to the Stars. So um, I had a few people um, kind of wrote little forwards on it that were celebrities mm -hmm. through it too. Okay. So, um, and then some of them um, said, hey, God, man, I would love to write something, but this is going to mess up my brand. You know, like Rick Ross. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to throw him out there. Rick Ross, yeah. if you listen, you're my buddy, bro. You know, I love you, man. But he was like, bro, I can't, I can't write nothing on it, man. I love you, man. But you know, it's going to mess up my brand. But I'll take a couple of copies and give me a couple of them Creflo Dollar CDs while you're at it. <laughs> and I say, all right, cool. You know, and, and you know, it is what it hey, is. But, hey, yeah. Doc, so, before you tell us about your second book, real quick, what touched you the most? Um, but just, just a short story about going into a situation where a child or a young person that you had an interaction with just really made you feel like, yeah, I'm supposed to be doing this. I should be out here uh, talking to these, these kids. Yeah, you know, one of the situations I remember having was, you know, I'm pulling up into a, into a like a, a middle school and, you know, I'm taking my time out of my day you know normally i would see patients so so the first thing you know you go in there and half of the, the kids they're not even paying attention to you yeah. you know and i'm just like man here it is you know for me to take a half a day off you know that cost me probably about six thousand dollars you know because that's what how much i can make seeing patients in a half day because of the type of work and the special work that i do and I'm like, here it is. Half of y'all ain't even paying no attention to me. In my mind, that's what I'm saying. Right. And then, you know, you will see that one and that's paying attention. And that one reminded, you know, he reminded me of me. You know, and I looked at him, I'm like, oh, man, this is that one guy that was paying attention. And I think about it, it's worth it for that one guy, even if no one else is, or, or one female, you know. And I tell my background and, some of them shaking their heads like, oh, yeah, that sounds like me. You know, nobody in my family went to college and, you know, my dad left or I didn't never know my dad. And we had to eat pork and beans and weenies for breakfast, lunch and dinner. And we had to boil hot dogs, these red link hot dogs where the water's still red. You know what I mean? That was your dinner and put some mayonnaise and, you know, uh, mustard on some white bread, you know, and that, that was your dinner. Ain't no veggies. You know what I mean? That's just what it was. And there was some, you know, so so when I'm able to resonate with a kid like that, I'm like, ah, man, I got to continue to do this. And it makes a difference. And some of these kids, man, I've been doing it so long. Some of them will find me on social media. So you probably don't remember me. You came and spoke to me 10 years ago. And now I'm a first year medical student. or I'm a second year dental student. Right. You know, or I started my business. And I'm like, I don't even know who these people Those are. Months. And they were like, they were like, yeah, you don't, you won't remember me. Um, you know, and case in point, you know, um, probably about 10 years ago, um, there was a guy that came and knocked on my door, a black guy. And he was just like, I want to be a dentist. I'm like, okay, a whole lot of people. And I didn't know who this guy was. And 
and he was just like, do you mind me hanging out? And, you know, my practice was kind of slower at the time. I'm like, all right, you can hang out. So we hung out. Man, this guy would come every day like it was a job. I'm like, man, you don't got to come every day. He's like, no, no, no. I just graduated from FAMU, and I really want to be a dentist. So he hung around every day, man. And one of my assistants ended up getting pregnant. I had always said I would never hire a, hire a male assistant because that would be kind of weird. And she got pregnant, and I was looking for another assistant. He was like, hey, I'll do it. I, I think I can handle it. And I hired him, man. He was awesome. Wow. And so he worked with me for about six months. He's like, man, I want to try to get into dental school. I'm like, all right, you know, can you, you know, can you write my recommendation? I wrote his recommendation. Turned out he didn't get in because his GPA wasn't high enough. And so I was just like, all right. He was like, man, Dr. Shore, can you do me one more favor? I'm like, all right, man, you already pushed me. You got a job here. I did everything. He's like, there's one dental school I really love. Is there any way you can call? and talk to the, um, to the program director, person, office of admissions, right. and tell them my story. And I'm like, all right. I called, told them the story. And they asked me to say, you know, would you give your right hand for this guy? And I'm like, believe it or not, I would. This guy was coming faithfully to my office every day. I didn't pay him a dime. I didn't even buy him lunch. And, and I think that he has a work ethic that's, that he will make it, you know? And they said, okay. And the next week they sent him a, um, a letter of acceptance. Wow. We got in, man. And I checked on him after about a semester. They said, man, this guy was kicking tail. He didn't have no financial problem. And he was helping other dental students with their homework. Wow. And they was like, they was like, we would not have ever taken him. Now, mind you, this was in Kentucky. I don't know anybody that even went there. You know, wow. um, and then he ended up graduating, um, doing really well. And now he's he's in his third year in private practice with his own office in Atlanta. And so for me to have been a key to someone's success like that is amazing. And, and he was just like, man, thank you for doing this for me. I said, the only thing I want you to do is do it for somebody else. Yep. You know, so so seeing stuff like that come around full circle, man, you can't you can't even pay for no. that. You know, being an African-American male, his dad had left him. He was raised by his grandmother at the time, um, you know, and it, he, he had a rough time, man. But but he 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 turned it around. And, um, you know, so he's 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 another young trailblazer, man, that's going to do it for somebody else. So. In fact, not, they just, what I've, what I've and not only, and not only that, let me, let me say this. So this past month, no, two months ago, they actually featured him in Atlanta magazine as one of the top dentists in Atlanta. Wow. Uh, his picture is on there and I'm looking at him like, golly, like, man. So, so what I'm saying is that his victory was my victory. Like seeing yeah. him, I'm right. like, man, like, right. you know, it made me feel great that, his victory was my victory in that because everybody that counted him out. Every school, dental school counted him out. And um, Kentucky took a chance on him and they said he was one of the best dental students they had because he was an all around person. He wasn't right. just academically, he cared about other people, he wanted to make sure other people succeeded. He shared and he did those intangibles that a lot of people just wouldn't do. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think people just don't value um the relationship with the mentor i think that that's life changing i think man if, if you if, if your office was busy and you couldn't do it you don't know where he would have been but the fact that you opened up your doors to this guy you didn't know to be a mentor i think so and all of us have been touched by mentors but i think i, I love the fact that that you know he wasn't asking for no money he just wanted time yeah. and i think that people who are listening got to understand man when we come up to people who we idolize just to hear what they have to say I mean, that their time is what's life-changing. So I think that that's really powerful. And I think, you know, Pastor Scott, I think, man, we have got to, especially in the African-American community, we got to be okay. With the, the hookup for us is not just about money. The hookup is like, yo, can I get your time? Like, can I sit down with you and just hear what you got to say? Because I think that is what kind of changes where we are. Dr. Short, I love that, though, man. That's, that's, that's awesome. That's awesome. And, and with your books, that, and I know we talked about your first book, Let's talk more about going into your second book. You know, uh, um, after the success of your first book, what 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 made you want to get into the to the next book? 
Well, I've always wanted to write a second one. And um, because, you know, as you know, and as you grow, you, 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 you learn differently. It's like, man, I need to go back and rewrite that whole thing, you know. <laughs> but what happens is, though, you know, um, God is a God of order and timing, you know, and he always going to give us fresh revelation as we sit at his feet and listen to what he says. Listen to what other people are saying. And, and our beliefs and stuff has to be challenged in order for us to grow. So my beliefs and stuff were challenged and I'm like, man, I gotta, I gotta, I'm ready to write another one. I just didn't have the time. So what leads me into the second one, here it is, in the eye of a storm, 45 days of turbulence and peace. Um, what happened was everything was going well, practice was going well, family was going well, but I was just like, man, you know, you start kind of getting, well, for me, you know, money doesn't drive me. You know, it's just experiences. And I want to do something different. I was like, man, I'm just tired of going in and doing the same thing. And even though it wasn't the same thing, it kind of felt like it. Mm -hmm. And um, we were, me and my family, past fall, we were um, on vacation and at a water park. Everything was going well. I ended up going down a water slide, hydroplane. I was holding my nose. I crashed into the other part of the slide. And my right thumb went through my left eyeball and almost knocked it out. So I went blind for a while and I couldn't practice and I couldn't see. And every time I would try to look out that eye, you know, the room would be like turning and twisted and blurry. And it was, it would give me headaches and vertigo and all those kind of things. So I'm like, what am I going to do? So unfortunately with this kind of trauma, there were no doctors that would take on the case because it's like, we don't know. I mean, your eye is messed up so bad. We don't even know if we can even fix it. So I'm like, all right, I don't have an associate. Um, what am I going to do with the practice? My bills are still coming in. What am I going to do? In the meantime, you know, fortunately, we saved for the rainy day. Um, we, we had, you know, we prepared and, and we had savings. I had some disability insurance. We had those things in place. So if something were to happen, we can balance the ship for a while until things get better. So I ended up having, this happened on September the 28th. Um, so in the process of this, you know, I'm praying, I'm like, God, like, how could you let this happen to me? You know, I, I serve you. I do those things. I'm one of the guys, one of the forerunners out there. I'm carrying your word in an atmosphere where people yeah. don't even care nothing about you. Yeah. Like, why would you let something like this happen to me? And I'm about to lose everything. And he, and he was just like, I just want you to put your thoughts on paper. And, and I and I would just get up in the middle of the night and, and just do a, a devotion. He'll just give me some things and I'm just typing it out fast as I can. And so um, probably about after about a month um, in, he was just like, I need you to write the second book. And I'm like, what am I going to call this book? And he says, dealing with your eye, it's a storm, in the eye of a storm. And he was like, you know, 45 days, you're going to, yeah. you, you're going to, you're going to, you're going to be out of it. You may not be out of it physically, but mentally you're going to be out of the storm. So fortunately I ended up finding a surgeon. He worked on my eye. This guy did a miracle on my eye. In fact, he did a job so well. He's never seen a case like this. He was an um, um, ophthalmolo ophthalmologist, um, eye right. surgeon. And he was surprised at how everything turned out. He said, man, I think you'll be able to go back to practice. And I'm like, are you serious? Because oh, you know, wait, real quick, doc, during this time, you didn't think you were ever going to practice again. No. Well, so what I do, I'm a microsurgeon. So I do microsurgery. So I use a microscope. So in my world, if I'm a, if I'm a half a millimeter off, the case won't work. Like it won't work and patients still being pain and swollen. So you're talking about a half a millimeter and my eye is jacked up. Like I, if I look straight, I couldn't even see any, I had to, I had to have a patch over my eye just to be able to have a normal life. <laughs> Cause if I didn't have the patch, things would be turned upside down, um, blurry vision. It would just, you know, so I'm looking like slick Rick for real. <laughs> and so, um, and so I didn't have an associate. So I'm thinking this, this is, this is getting ready to, you know, I don't know what's going to happen. And my staff was still there and I'm like, well, what if God does a miracle? And if I left my staff go, I got to start back. So I kept them there. They were on payroll and I didn't know when I was going to return and they probably was playing solitaire or whatever. I don't know what they were doing. So we kept them on payroll during the whole injury. So I had the surgery 
I want my eye. Um, surgery went pretty good. So as I was going through the whole process, I was writing a book. So I ended up publishing a book in December and I published the book without even knowing I was going to able, able to be able to return back to practice mm. because I understand that oftentimes where people need help is in the middle of their storm and the mm. eye storm is not on the other side. Right. And so when I wrote the book, I wrote it to really help people go through life storms when they're in the middle of it. Because anybody can give advice when you're in the when you're at the end, you look back. But during the middle of it is where it's tough. And so as people read the book, you'll be able to see my feel, you'll be able to feel what I'm saying because it's real feeling, it's in the moment. Mm. Like when when it says day seven, day, day 17, it's in the moment. It's not, oh, let me go back and reflect. No, it is day 17 where I even say, I still, I'm still blind out of one eye, but God is good. And I start talking about different scriptures, Jeremiah 29, 11, where God already has a plan for our lives from the foundation of the world. And, 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 and this encourages my faith. Now, in the meantime, I'm fighting the enemy, you know, mentally, like anxiety. I'm having, I'm like, for one point, I'm like, I think only white people have anxiety. You know what I mean? I'm like, anxiety? Why are you taking anxiety drugs? I'm like, because I've never faced any. Man, I actually got touched with anxiety. Like, I wake up in the middle of the night with cold sweats and shake because I'm like, I don't know what's going to happen. How am I going to take care of God? You have put me in a... So I'm at the pinnacle of my career. Like, I'm in a country club. I'm the only black man in a country club in my country. And I'm the youngest. You know, I asked God for a home with, with a four car garage. He blessed us with that. You know, I got all the things and I'm like, we got, some of this stuff ain't paid for. Right. How you, how, what, what's going to happen? Are you going to have me to be the laughing stock of my neighborhood, the laughing stock of my community? Because as God was blessing me with these things, I got on social media and talked about it and I showed it like, Hey, I live here. This is where I live. You know, I have a 10,000 square foot home. You know, and not to be braggadocious, it's about, you know, this is what, but guess where I came from? I came from a one bedroom apartment. Right, I lived in the right. projects before. Right. You know what I mean? This is what God is doing. Yeah, this yeah. is, this is, yeah. this is what yeah. he's done. In fact, I didn't even want to move over here. You know, my wife was pressuring me. My neighborhood was going down. My neighbors would unplug my cable. The neighbors wouldn't cut their grass where I was living at. You know, they would have uh, my next door neighbor had a, 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 he was a um, tractor trailer owner and um, he would park his rig right in front of my house. I'm like, bro, you can't do that. And he was like Debo. So I'm like, all right, if I tell him, he's going to try to fight me, he's going to shoot me. Because he was from, you know. He now, was, why did we go to watch it though? Because you did move there first. Well, you didn't move straight to the community that you're in exactly. now. Exactly. And guess how long I was there for? Mm. I was there for 14 years. Mm. Mm. Wow. So it didn't happen overnight. I was there for 14 years, and I lived below my means. And, mm -hmm. I, I, didn't, and I didn't want to move. I was satisfied. You were content where you were. <laughs> oh, I was happy. But then I'm going to tell you what happened. I had been praying. I was like, Lord, you know, if you want me to move, you're going to have to make enough you're going to have to open the door. And so the door, we were looking at houses, every house we liked, the door would close. I'm like, all right. So there was this one house, which was this one. I never forget. There was a, it was, it was that year before Halloween. So my kids knew some people that lived in the neighborhood. So we were walking around doing some trick or treating and we saw this house and my kids was like, let's look in this house. That's a nice house. It's not ringing the doorbell. So nobody came. And my wife, with her nose herself, and looked through the door and tried to peek in there. <laughs> and I'm like, man, these people are going to shoot us over here. Put us in jail. <laughs> so we left. And so come to find out that my wife had a friend that knew somebody that owned the home. This is a builder's home. And they actually went to my kid's school. And they didn't want to put up a sign that said they were, you know, they were going to put up for sale. So we found out about it. And when I came and looked at it, I'm like, man, this is that house. I'm like, but there's no way I can afford it. They're like, I mean, I'm like, I told my wife, I said, look, we're not making any more money. Like, there's no way I can afford this. So she was all upset. 
And then God was like, you can't, but I can. I'm like, oh. mm. he said, this is going to be a faith mm. walk for you. And I was like, Lord, you can't just pay for it in cash. He's like, no, because if I do that, that's not faith. He said, I want you to mm. depend on me. Preach. Yeah. Every Preach. Single day. Yeah. And he that's said, good. he said, and he, and he took me back to the children of Israel and the manna. And he said, a lot of them were trying to save up the manna because they was afraid it wasn't going to come back tomorrow. Right. And they went, right. uh -huh. he's, like, uh -huh. he's like, he's like, I'm going to provide for you in ways that you're not going to even understand. Every day. And Every I'm like, day. I'm like, Lord, all right. And, and, come on, and, Doc. and I, I, I had to put my chest out. I put my chin out. I said, God, open the door and I'm going to walk in it. And he opened the door. Man, these people didn't even want to sell us. So when they found out that I was black, they was like, oh, well, we have some other buyers and this and that, mm -hmm. you know, and I'm like, okay, God, you know, whatever. And then the other buyers backed out and they had to leave. So <laughs> we ended up, um, you know, selling. I mean, we, and then I had two mortgages. I'm like, Lord, I got two mortgages. What am I going to do? Man, we put our other home up for sale. And in a matter of three weeks, the home sold for the exact amount we had said. And they wanted 90% of our furniture that wouldn't have worked in our house. Wow. So we just had to pretty much pack our clothes. Just in case somebody don't get it, it's, 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 it's not curious. It always happens. But when God has you do something impossible, you see him moving. You see evidence. Right. I mean, even though we have to have faith. Right. He still shows up in ways to to give us glimpses to make make to make us know that we're going in the right way. Yeah. I mean, even though you stepped out on faith, but then God did this, but yeah. then God did that, right. and so you know you're on the right track. I'm just so glad that God will just give us a glimpse. Look, I, yeah. I know you want me to step out on faith, but God is just like, let me give you this little bit of thing so make you know that it's, it is me. Uh, yeah. it, it is me. Uh, listen, we I know we, we could talk to you forever, Doc, but um, do you have any parting words? Um, well, I got I to gotta ask the Doc one question, man. Before you know, we, we've been talking about work and him working hard and doing this stuff. Doc, what do you enjoy to do on your downtime? We talk about mental health a, a lot. We talk about, you know, folk who, who, who work themselves into the ground. What do you do to stay fresh with your family? What are your hobbies? What do you just, what, what's, what's, what's your day look like when you just get to relax? What's, what's that like for you, man? Yeah, well, I mean, one of the things is that, you know, I try to develop a routine. I like to um, get up early. Uh, I like to spend time in God's word and meditate. And that kind of gets my day started. And I, and I do some kind of exercise. I, I make sure I do something for about 45 minutes to an hour. And then um, I try to make sure I spend quality time with my family. And that's, you know, with, so with the book, man, before the book, I was so busy traveling and I was neglecting my family. I didn't realize it. And so when God sat me down for six months, because by the grace of God, this is my first month back to work where I didn't even think I thought it was over, you know. Um, you know, being able to have quality time, man, without the noise really helped. And with people going through the COVID virus, coronavirus and stuff, and they've only had to sit down for three weeks, I'm yeah. like, dude, I've done it for six months. <laughs> and, and, and I was able to reinvest into my marriage, reinvest into my children, and reinvest to what's that. more important. And I realized I that. that, God, if you take all this stuff away, man, if you can still give me my sanity, my health, and my family, you've done more than enough. And so now I'm not a slave to this stuff. You know, it's nice, it's good, but if he says, okay, all right, man, I'm going to take you in a different direction. You need to pack it up, box it up, and let's do something different. I'm cool with it because I know that he's going to take care of me. So I love reading stuff. I love um, having, um, you know, spending time with people on social media, trying to mentor um, young adults um, love that. And, and those kind of things. So, you know, though, you know, I enjoy driving my cars and, you know, just, just normal everyday stuff, man. Um, you know, spending time with my girls um, and just trying to be a resource to a lot of people who are trying to figure this thing out, you know, and just, you know, being a light in darkness, yeah. you know, uh, so, so yeah. So how, how do we connect with you? How do we find you? How, social media? 
where how, if someone's listening or they want to follow you, where do we go to, to keep in touch with you? So um, <laughs> I would say Facebook, but unfortunately I'm maxed out on Facebook, <laughs> which I guess is a good problem to have. I guess depends on your platform, but you still can follow me, but I just can't accept you as a friend. Um, you can follow me on LinkedIn. I post a lot of stuff on LinkedIn as well. And also Instagram. And you can find me at all those at um, Dr. Rico Short. Um, that's D-R-R-I-C-O-S-H-O-R-T. That's my, um, my handle there. Um, and so, or you can email me um, as well. My email is dr.short at yahoo.com. If I don't get back with you, immediately is because I got a lot of other stuff going on, but I promise you I will um, get back with you. Um, so that's how you connect. And if you're interested in my books, um, In the yeah. Eye of a Storm, and also Get Into the Rooter Problem, both are available on um, Amazon, Amazon's platform. And also my first book, Get Into the Rooter Problem, is available at Barnes and Nobles. Also is available on iTunes as well. Um, so yeah, that's how you can connect with me. Man, we appreciate this, Doc, man. Thanks so much, man. Hey, My man, pleasure. Man. Yes, sir, man. May the Lord bless you and keep you. I know he's been doing it. I'm just, I just want to put him on a little more. Yeah, well, I appreciate it, man. The evidence is clear. Yeah, yeah. I, I appreciate it.